Well, good evening, folks. I'm going to do my best to speak into the mic. You already know I'm not going to, right? I, mean, I said I'm going to do my best. That means I'm not going to, but I'm going to do my best to try. Let's get this a little bit closer here. Chris, are we good? Uh, okay. All right. What a mess. What a complete disaster. How did we get here? There are people that are alive today that remember reading the Bible in public school, if you can imagine. You know, that was back when the problem in public school was, I don't know, running in the halls. Now we have litter boxes in the halls. How did we get here? My friends, I have four questions to present to you tonight. You already saw them if you saw the brochure. They are, what now? What does the Bible say? As Christians, how do we prepare? And finally, how do we reach the next generation? You probably saw that if you saw the brochure, all four questions. I have two main ideas that I want to get across tonight. The first one is that the character of the voters is, is, the, is the most important consideration in any election. We complain about the character of the candidates, and we have much to complain about there. But what about the character of the electorate? What about that? I'm going to be speaking to that tonight. There is such a thing as an electorate that doesn't deserve good candidates. That happens. Secondly, I want to make the point that God, a gracious and merciful God, is merciful even in the midst of judgment. And if you don't think we're under a judgment now, you need to get out a Bible and read it. Because there's an awful lot in the scriptures that talk about God saying, you know, because you've rejected me, I reject you. And he says things like, I'm going to cause you to stagger like a drunken man. I think we just kind of got that for a senator here in Pennsylvania. A staggering cadaver that you wouldn't want to hire to babysit your children. We got it right here in Pennsylvania now. How do we get it? What is going on? But we have a merciful God. I want to talk about that tonight. I want to read a couple of passages uh, for you tonight, because what I want to do, first of all, by the way, can you all hear me okay, even when I'm speaking this way? Yes. All right, good. I'm glad to hear that. You know why? Because I'm actually going to get louder. Um, this, is, this, is a this is a quiet part of it. A couple passages I want to read to you. Um, the first one is from Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verses 4 through 10. I want you to hear what God says to Jeremiah and about the nations. He says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. Plural. Not nation, nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, I'm a youth. The Lord said to me, do not say I'm a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set this day, I have, I have this day set you over the nations, plural, and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. I'll comment on that a little bit more, but right now I just want to say this. Don't forget we're talking about nations, plural, here. This idea that God in his word only spoke to the Old Testament children of Israel has just got to go. He spoke to the nations. He speaks to this nation today. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the 
nations that forget God. And nowadays we have people saying, well, what does a Christian nation look like? I'm not going to get into the Christian nationalist debate. That has a lot of baggage and it's hard to define. But the fact of the matter is, God expects nations to worship him. How does the nation worship him? By obeying his word. We're going to talk about that this evening, for sure. Nahum, chapter 2, the prophet Nahum. I want to read this. You'll see why in a moment. Nahum, chapter 2, verse 13. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. The next chapter, verse 7. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you. Now, why am I reading that? Here's why. Because Nineveh wasn't, or the book of Nahum was not written to the Jews. We always say, ah, the Old Testament, we can put a fork in that. Don't need to listen to the Old Testament because it was written to the Jews. Nahum, the book of Nahum, the prophet Nahum was not a prophet to the Jews. He was a prophet to the Assyrians, to the Ninevites. We're going to talk about them a little bit later too. If Nahum is speaking to the Ninevites, he is certainly speaking to us today. And I want you to think about what he just said. Behold, I am against you. Question for you tonight. How can you and I know if God Almighty is or is not against us tonight? How can we know that? Can we know it? Do we just have to guess? Whatever else we do, my friends, we do not want to have the God the creator God, against us. Whatever else we do, we don't want that. Can't have it. Well, a few things I want to say to you tonight. Christ has dominion, dominion over the nations, as clearly shown by Jeremiah and Nahum. The Lord spoke to Jeremiah and ordained him a prophet to the nations. The book of Nahum was written to the, against the people of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. It was not written against the people of, of, of the, the Jewish people. How do we handle all this? Well, we read in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. Correction. That's something we might want to pay attention to in North America in 2022 because some serious correction is needed, and all Scripture is good for that. Now, I want to make a clarifying point at the outset, and that's this. I do not consider voting and casting a ballot to be the same thing. I'll use the term voting tonight. Um, usually when we say vote, we mean cast a ballot. The way I understand it works is that you cast a ballot for a particular candidate, but the vote happens someplace else, whoever's counting them. So I know who I cast the ballot for, but honestly, I don't have a clue, number one, who I voted for. And I don't care who hears me say it. I'm a pastor, and I answer to Almighty God through his word. And I'm, as I've said to many people, I'm going to be dead soon. I'm 64. Even if I live another 30 years, I'm going to be dead soon. While I'm here, I better speak what the Bible tells me to speak, and nothing less. For your reflection, by way of introduction, two viewpoints that will serve to illustrate this idea of voting. The first, in an article entitled, Voting After Dobbs, Dobbs, of course, being the uh, Supreme Court decision that overthrew Roe, Ro, from author, didn't overthrow it enough. Um, from author Andrew Walker on the American Reformer website, Mr. Walker is also a seminary professor of Christian ethics. <clears throat> he states, after making his case for voting based on the candidate's position on abortion, he says the following, am I saying that a Christian who votes for a pro-abortion candidate is not a Christian? I can't go that far because I'm not God. I may not be able to question the status of faith in the inner recesses of their heart, but I can question their devotion to obeying the scripture 
and the Spirit's influence over their life when clear principles that ought to guide every area of a Christian's life are stubbornly cast off. He goes on to say, voting is a good thing to do as a citizen, but it's good only insofar as the agency used in how one votes does not do any harm. Psalm 34, 14 states, turn away from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. Let us be Christians who turn away from evil and not work to install it into, pow install it into power. That's from Andrew Walker. On the other hand, we have another Andrew weighing in on the subject. Who here has heard of Andrew Torba? A few of you have. Andrew Torba is, creative, is the creator of this free speech online platform known as Gab.com. By all accounts with which I am familiar, Andrew Torba is a man of great courage. He has withstood countless attempts to cancel not only his business, but his person and family being denied by at least one bank local to him the ability, ability to do personal business. He has withstood more than his share of threats and intimidation. He says this, Every election people say, this was written before the election, or should I say the C-election, I believe every election season people say, this is the most important election in our lifetimes. This time I believe they are correct. The lives of millions of unborn children are at stake in this election. Democrats are threatening to codify Roe into federal law if they get power. While Repub Republican states are promising to enforce existing laws on the books or pass new ones to stop the satanic murder of babies in this country. Our economy is in shambles, our cities are war zones, our border is being invaded to the tune of millions of people, including criminals, drug dealers, and worse. Our elected officials are sending billions and billions of dollars of our money to a foreign country for a war that has nothing to do with you and me. This country is a mess. If you are a Christian, the cho choice is clear. Vote Republican. If you call yourself a Christian you are and are voting Democrat, you need to be under church discipline for voting to empower evil. If your pastor, if your pastor or priest is encouraging you to vote for pro-choice candidates, you need to find a new church. That's how serious this issue is. God is very clear in His word: "Thou shall not kill." And so we have, that's the end of Torba, and this is me again. And so we have contrasting views on how one should vote. These views on how one should vote often spill over into the topic of whether one should vote at all. For my part, I have little confidence in our pre present electoral system. My reason is simple. I cannot trust anyone who approves baby murder to be an honest ballot counter. Oh, yes. I'm good with killing babies, but I wouldn't dream of compromising any aspect of election integrity, be it far from me. Stop, you incredible lying hypocrites. Finally, once again by way of introduction, I need to address those who may question my right, or more, or more accurately, my responsibility to speak to the social and political sphere. You all know there's plenty like that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my church, they won't talk about these kinds of things. Shouldn't be talking about that. Just preach the gospel. You know what? As long as I'm preaching the scriptures, I am preaching the gospel. Amen. What, do we, what do we have, the section of the scriptures here and the gospel here? Who, who's going to get that knife and divide that one up for us? I must ask, do the scriptures speak to that sphere of human activity, meaning the political and social sphere? If the answer is yes, then what right do I have to be silent? I have no right. If the Bible speaks to the political and social sphere, if it does, then I have no right to be silent. I am failing God if I do not address it. To the theologians, pastors, professors, and churchmen who say, keep politics out of the pulpit, I say, your problem is not with me, but it's with the scriptures, because the Holy Spirit certainly did not keep politics out of the Bible. And shame on you for pretending that he did. Do they realize that we have entire books of the Bible, sections of the Bible even,
that deal extensively with the civil and political sphere. How about Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther? And that's without even mentioning Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Proverbs, as well as the prophets, including the New Testament prophet John the Baptist, Paul the Apostle, all of which had much to say to the political sphere in general and civil magistrates in particular. Imagine that, being told that the Bible doesn't speak to the political sphere, and we have two books called First and Second Kings. And if you think I'm indicting most of the North American Christian church today, if you think I'm indicting them, I'm not. They've indicted themselves. Speaking of John the Baptist, please understand why he got thrown into prison by Herod. I want you to hear this about John the Baptist. This is just two verses. I hope you don't forget these verses. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, rebuked by John, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. Did you hear that? John, this godly prophet, went to Herod and said, you can't steal your brother's wife. Let me ask you a question. How many churchmen today would not be rebuking Herod, but would actually be rebuking John? Ask yourself that question, my friends. How many would do that? John, John, yeah. Herod doesn't believe in, in, in God. John, back up, back up, John. Come on now. John, he's probably going to throw you in prison if you do this. Today's churchmen would rebuke John and not Herod. You can be sure of it. We have a question and answer time later. And if anybody wants to challenge me on that point, I'm definitely ready for you. (laughs) But do you hear what he said? But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, Herod had stolen his brother's wife. And listen to this, and for all the evils which Herod had done. My friend, is that, is that music to your ears? A godly prophet in the face of a wicked king. And the king had enough, and he put him in jail. I sometimes wonder, with all the wickedness and the horror that's going on today as a pastor, how am I not in jail? Seriously, I don't want to go to jail. I I, I truly don't. But we have wickedness everywhere we look. And we pastors? Well, let's have church on Zoom as long as the money keeps coming in. Amen. You're right, brother. Great. The act of voting considered, I want to address this. What does voting fix? Voting can only benefit the voter insofar as the candidate being ultimately confirmed in office is fit for the office. Mm-hmm. What does it ruin? The actual act of voting or casting a ballot, you understand. It ruins nothing, however, the actual act doesn't. However, the results of voting can ruin the society to the extent that the candidate being confirmed in office is unfit for that office. Why voting is now taken so seriously. Exodus 18, 16 talks about this, and I wanna, I wanna go there very briefly here because I, wanna, I, need, I need to address this. Exodus 18, 16. This is a point I want to get across. This is Jethro, or Moses speaking to his father-in-law, Jethro. He says, when they have a difficulty, meaning these people, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. You know why voting has become so important? Because it's not about disputes between one person and another, just like I I just read. Moses said, I make a, a, a judgment between two people. Moses didn't know that the, the crimes are against the state. Follow me on this. What do we say? A person goes to jail and he's paid his debt to society. No, no, no. I steal from you. I don't owe society. I owe you. 
but we've all gotten the socialistic thing. We're so socialistic, we don't even know how bad we are. We really, truly don't. We don't know how bad it is. Moses is talking about judging between one and another. It's offenses against another person, not against the state. Think about that. Second thing I want to say is that his job then was to actually apply the law of God to the disputants. And here, mo, mo, voting has got to be this big thing. Did you see some of the commercials prior to? I mean, I, there's a lot of annoying stuff that I see on YouTube. I mean, it's, it's, I, I can't talk about it all. One of the most annoying things is, is people telling you to vote. You know, these commercials say, get out there and vote. <laughs> you know what? If you need a commercial to tell you to vote, you are unqualified to cast a ballot. And then you see something, voting on school lunches and all these benefits. You see what they're doing? They're dividing up the pie. That's our socialist nonsense going on again. You know, oh, you know, make sure you vote to get your piece of the pie. You know, when you're dividing up the bend, it's really important to vote. See, it's gotten, it's gotten really, really big and wide that way. All we can do is kind of like try to reach out and grab the other guy's stuff. You know, my, I love my congressman. He gets in there with both hands and gets everybody else's money and brings it back to me. And speaking of that, I want to briefly address the Democrat-Republican thing a little bit. A little bit. We all know the Republicans, grassroots Republicans, hate their leadership with a passion. They hate them. Rightly so. Here's, and it was mentioned, um, Peggy mentioned this earlier tonight, the Republicans don't stick together. I want to I, I wanna maybe just address maybe why that is a little bit. And I'm going to make a general statement. It doesn't apply to everyone. But I want you to think about this as I speak tonight. Here's the thing. Republicans are motivated. Well, I'll start with the Democrats. I'll start with the Republicans. <laughs> Re Republicans, generally speaking, at, at this level, are motivated by justice. Democrats are motivated by power. Yep. Right. And so that, that is one of the reasons why you see some of the things happen that you do, because you, you, you can argue about what's just among yourselves. The Democrats, what they do is say, let's just... Excuse me. Let's just grab all the power. We'll divide it up later. Everybody vote for the, our Democrat buds because this is about power for us, and we'll worry about who gets it a little bit later. That's one of the reasons I know Republicans get frustrated, and people that I trust honor Christ and his word get frustrated. But if our motivation is justice, that sometimes can be a little bit harder to figure out than good old-fashioned raw political power. That's just an aside. Now... I want to consider the character of the of the, um, the, 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 the uh, of the of the candidate, the votee. I'll call him. I want to make a distinction, be, uh, or I want to talk about the positions taken by the candidate. Every candidate takes positions. You know what the problem with the position is? It can change, and, do, and they do it all the time. I want you to ask yourself this question the next time you approach a candidate. Every candidate takes a position based on one of two things, and they don't mix, usually. One of two things. Number one, conviction, or number two, convenience. Every candidate takes a position based on one or the other of that. And if the candidate is taking the position based on conviction, well, maybe that's something you have. But if it's on convenience, you can be sure that that position is going to change. Something for you to know. Well, I now want to talk about the character of the voter. This is important because you know what? When we're talking about the character of the voter, that's something you can do. We all have complaints about what's going on. And we should. There's a lot that we can't do something about, but you know what we can do something about? We can do something about us. We can do that. How about our character? From a sermon by John Witherspoon, 
president of the College of New Jersey, entitled The, Divin the Divinion of Providence Over the Passions of Men. It was preached in 1776. Some of you already know that he was the only clergyman. I was telling somebody I'm disorganized. Okay, that won't happen again. John Witherspoon, some of you are aware, was the only clergyman to sign the Declaration of Independence. He says this, talking about the character of the voters, talking about the character of people in general. He says, nothing can be more absolutely necessary to true religion than a clear and full conviction of the sinfulness of our nature and state. Without this, there can be neither repentance in the sinner nor humility in the believer. Without this, all that is in Scripture of the wisdom and mercy of God in providing a Savior is without force and without meaning. But where can we have a more affecting view of the corruption of our nature than in the wrath of man when exerting itself in oppression, cruelty, and blood? It must be owned indeed that this truth is abundantly manifest in times of the greatest tranquility. Others may, if they please, treat the corruption of our nature as a chimera or a ghost. For my part, I see it everywhere. And I feel it every day. All the disorders in human society and the greatest part even of the unhappiness we are exposed to arises from the envy, malice, covetousness, and other lusts of man. If we and all about us were just what we ought to be in all respects, we should not need to go any further for heaven, for it would be upon earth. But war and violence present a spectacle still more awful. How affecting it is to think that the lust of domination should be so violent and universal that men should so rarely be satisfied with their own possessions and acquisitions or even with the benefits that would arise from such mutual service, but should look upon the happiness and tranquility of others as an obstruction to their own. I recently had a chance to speak to, well, every, one of the things I do, I try every Wednesday to speak to the Lancaster County Commissioners. It's a great opportunity. They meet at 9.15 every Wednesday, or almost every Wednesday. And they, have, they give opportunity for public, uh, public comment. And so I try to take advantage of that. One of the things I said that at least one of the commissioners took issue with, I said that socialism is based on envy. Social is based on wanting my neighbor's stuff. And everybody's a socialist when their neighbor has more than they do but they're not so much of a socialist when their neighbor has less than they do. Not so much. And at least one of the commissioners took issue with that. And I said, we have the 10th commandment. Do not covet what is your neighbor's. Don't do this. Coveting. The 10th commandment ruins everything. And I see that hand. I will, there will definitely be a chance for questions. They are. Anybody can be there. Anybody can go. Yep. If you want to come, be, come there and support me, I'll, uh, I'll welcome you. For sure. Good question. Couple things. I want you to see God's mercy in the history of Israel. But first, before I do that, I want to go to 2 Kings chapter 13. This is an important passage because I want to talk about conservatism. Because I want to ask this night, if you're a conservative, some of you have been conservatives for a long time, ask yourself this question. What have you conserved? You know, years ago we were fighting other battles. We were fighting the homosex marriage battle at one point. Now we've given up on that. Now we've got the trans sex thing going on. And now we've got the litter boxes in the bathrooms. Listen to this, what happened with this king. In the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoiaz, the son of Jeho, Je, Jehu, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned to 17 years. Now listen to this. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He did not apart the Lord and of Hazel King 
and in the land of Ben Hadad, the son of Haziel, all their days. Now, here's what happened. Ahab and Jezebel, his ghastly wife, had introduced Baal worship. Baal was a god who ate up children. He was like Moloch. In order to keep Baal happy, you had to feed live children to be burned to death. That was Baal worship. That was Moloch worship. Israel was not the only one to do that. There's an awful lot of discussion nowadays about whether or not that really happened. You know what? It really happened. Have you heard of baby sacrifice? Yeah, we don't do that here, of course. I think we have 70 million sacrifices we have to answer for. But you see what happened here. The son of Ahab, or the descendant of, of, of Jehu, excuse me, Jehu had come along. He was a, he was a, a, um, a general. He had been anointed king in the, in, in, the, in the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom. Israel, the ten tribes, was the northern kingdom. And Jehu became the king. And he's the one that wiped out Baal worship. He ended Baal worship. But what happened was, his own son then becomes king, and his own son may remind me of conservatives. His own son doesn't go back to worshiping the true God, his own son goes back to worshiping the golden calves. Do you see what I'm saying here? Do you hear this? Let's go back to this better time. But you know what? Anything that doesn't get, back, get us back to Christ and his word is going to get the same thing as you had before eventually. Anything. You see, this king is kind of like a conservative. Let's go back. You know, we, we want to do that, right? Let's go back maybe to the 50s. We'd all be happy, right? But Christ is king. He is king. And I'm saying that not as, a, not as an imperative, but as a declarative. Right? Go back to your English class, right? An imperative is a sentence of the way things should be, right? A declarative sentence is the way they are. Not saying tonight that Christ should be king. He is king, and he's introduced in the book of Revelation as the ruler of the kings of the earth. And my friends tonight, every single civil magistrate, I hate that word lawmaker. I hate the word. They think they, they're making laws. You know what? Every single code that they ever enact is either in line with the law of Christ or against it, and there's no neutrality anywhere. There's one lawgiver, there's one king, and he reigns above, and he's not up for re-election anytime soon. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to kind of speed through here because we're running out of time here quickly enough. There's a couple things I want to say. In Hebrews, we have the names of four judges, Gideon, Barak, and Jephthah, or, or th excuse me, of the um, three of the four. The other one was Samson. When you read through the book of Judges, you see God raising up Moab, Ammon, the Philistines, the Midianites, against the Israelites because of their idolatry and because of their sin against God. But even in the midst of that, my friends, God raises up deliverers when they turn back to him. Now, what I, the reason why I say that is you have people in Christian circles saying, well, you know, we're under judgment now. Under judgment! We are. Nothing we can do. You know what? God still wants you to be faithful. God's still telling you to worship him and him alone. And God has raised up deliverers in the midst of his own judgment. Understand that. He raised up these four, actually raised up more judges, but in every case, it's said that God raised up these enemies and then God sent them a deliverer. My friends, when's the last time? When is the last time you prayed and told God you agree with him that you are part of a wicked and sinful nation? I encourage you to do that, my friends. I seriously can't encourage you that, that, that way enough. You know what? I, here's a question for you. I sure would like a deliverer right about now. Do we deserve one? No. The electorate. Us. 
If we got to deliver, the first thing we'd ask is, is he electable or not? <laughs> That's what we'd want to know first. Not is he true, not is he honest. Does he hate covetous, covetousness? You know that the Bible says that, right? Exodus 18. A civil magistrate has to hate covetousness. You know, like... <laughs> All, all kinds of politicians take a position against being co covetous. Oh, I'm against that. No. Jethro told Moses, you've got to get people that hate it. They hate a bribe. They hate, they hate anything that perverts justice. Anywhere at all, they hate it. You see, hate is a family value after all. you just got to make sure you hate the right things. And Jethro used that word, hate. Covetousness. I want to show you something else, though. I want to show you God's mercy in the history of Assyria. Assyria, a dangerous, horrific kingdom. If you know much about the Assyrians, they were extremely cruel. The Babylonians, the Romans, the Greeks, none of them were nearly as, as cruel as the Assyrians. The prophet Jonah was sent to the Assyrians, as we'll see here in a moment. But I first of all want to read you a verse that many of you are going to be familiar with. It's 2 Chronicles 7, 14. You've heard of it. Solomon is praying. He says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now some, I've heard people say, in fact, I just got an email from someone, uh, it was yesterday. That doesn't apply to us. That only applies to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. That's got nothing to do with us if it's, it, if it's my people after all. I want to demonstrate something to you right now. It has to do with Jonah. It has to do with Assyria. But I want you to remember the order in which I just read this. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. That's a promise God gave. But does it apply to us? Well, let's just see who it applied to. I have to turn over to the book of Jonah here. Tell me what you think of this during the uh, Q&A time, all right? There's only three speakers in the book of Jonah. There's Jonah, there's God, and there's, and there's the king of Nineveh. Jonah shows up. He has quite the, uh, he's got quite the message. I always think of his message when I hear from people, hey, you know what? Pastor Joel, you've got to tone it down. You, 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 have to, you, know, you, you, you have to build rapport with people. You, know, you, you can't give them such a message that it'll turn away. You know, I want to be communicative. I, I don't want to turn people off for the wrong reason. I really don't. But I want you to consider Jonah's message. Here's Jonah's message for everybody who wants dialogue and common ground. You ready? Jonah rose and, and, and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day, first, first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. How's that for, uh, you know, I'm okay, you're okay. <laughs> Let's sit down at the negotiating table. You know, all we want is a place at the table. So the people of Nineveh believed God. Proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to King Nineveh, and he rose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Remember this sequence? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves first, right? So we see that going on with the king. He sat in ashes. It says he covered himself with sackcloth, and he caused it to be ordained, proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by his decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. There's a, my people shall, uh, shall humble themselves and cry mightily to God, pray and seek his face. 
Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. It's almost as if the king of Nineveh had read 2 Chronicles 7.14. You know, my friends, if the king of Nineveh can apply 2 Chronicles 7.14, I'm pretty sure we can, my friends. You know, that's a, that's a message of hope for you, for us tonight. There is a God who is merciful. There is a God who hears. There is a God that even forgave the city of Nineveh. But do we want his forgiveness? Have we even agreed with him that we need it? Finally tonight, I want to take you to Daniel 9. Daniel, this godly man. I want to talk about him a little bit. Daniel chapter 9. In that we see Daniel's prayer of confession. Daniel was a man who understood that they, that they had sinned mightily against God. And I want you to hear some of what he says. Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. My friends, does that apply to us? Our country, so blessed by God. We sing America, America, God shed his grace on you. That's not a joke. We have received his grace amazingly. And what have we done with it? Right now, we can't run away from him fast enough. We have qualified here to what Daniel's saying. Sin committed iniquity. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers, and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but unto us shame of face as it is this day. And I don't have time to read the entire prayer. But you know what Daniel does? I hope you get a chance to read this later. You know what Daniel does in his prayer? He doesn't say, we turned away because you've given us shabby kings. You know what he says in his prayer? He says, you gave us shabby kings because we turned away from you. That's what he says. My friends, tonight, the character of the electorate, so much more important than the character of the candidates. Well, another thing about Daniel that I want to say. Daniel was a man who interpreted dreams and visions. He had direct communication from God. But interestingly enough, here... He doesn't get a direct communication from God that it's time to go back to Judah after 70 years. You know how he found it out? He read the Bible. He read Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the one that said, you're going to go back after 70 years. And I, Daniel's saying, that's how I found out. What do you and I know about what the Bible actually says? If, Jeremiah's, or if Daniel's not reading Jeremiah, he doesn't figure this out. You and I must know what God has actually said in his word. We must know this. He gave us this book for a reason, my friends. And for us to ignore it is to insult him. Daniel understands by reading what was already in the, in the scripture. Secondly, I have two verses here to, as we wrap up. Isaiah 41, 28, For I looked, and there was no man. I looked among them, but there was no counselor who, when I asked of them, could answer a word. And Ezekiel twenty two thirty. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. But you know what I believe, my friends? I believe he did find someone. I believe he found Daniel. Daniel, who could read God's word 
and who was so offended and outraged and shocked, quite frankly. You read, you read his words there, he's like shocked. He's, he's like, I can't believe how bad we've done, how horribly we've done. Daniel was a man who I believe stood in the gap. I ask you tonight, my friends. What about you? Do you know the word of God? Are you outraged at what this country has become? Could you be one to stand in that gap? Twice God said, once in Isaiah, once in Ezekiel, I didn't see anyone, but Daniel was one, that, that one man. And so tonight, so much more I'd love to say. What now? What does the Bible say? And as Christians, how do we prepare? And so I kind of put these questions all together with just a few more comments. I believe Daniel shows us the way. It's a way of faithfulness to Christ and to his word. I didn't tell you nearly enough tonight. There's so much more that the Bible has to say to the political sphere of activity. But I will say this. You and I are not called to save the nation. We are called to be faithful. We are all called to that. My friends, if we refuse to be faithful to Christ, why in the world should he send a deliverer for us if we're not going to be faithful to him? That's our first priority. Do you know how God was so merciful to his people? There are times in the Bible, when I was preparing I saw moments where God says, you know what, the people, the children of Israel were so oppressed, I couldn't even stand it. God says, I, I myself couldn't even stand it. I had to send the deliverers. So bad. Here's the thing, though. What would we do with a godly deliverer if we had one? What would we do? The character, my friends, of the electorate here. But the exciting thing is, God moved through the character of one man, Daniel. One man. Well, finally, how do we reach the next generation? That's the fourth question that we opened up with. Oh, there's so much more I'd love to say. But how do we reach the next generation? First of all, we have to have a next generation. This war on children's been going on for a long time. It didn't start with Roe versus Wade. It started a long time before that when we decided that children were somehow a curse. When God clearly says they're a blessing. You know, children were the only group that I know of that Christ never had a bad word to say about. He had some things to say to his disciples. There were some other folks he had some things to say. He never had a bad word to say about children. In fact, he said a bad word to his disciples when his disciples were trying to keep the children away from him. God loves children. We must encourage children. We must encourage babies. Let's have some babies around here, huh? Where is everybody? First of all, we have to have a next generation. You know why? You know why man was put on the earth? You know the first command that was given to men? Adam and Eve there? Be fruitful and multiply. Let's get some people around here. Let's take dominion over this earth, and the way it's going to happen is we're going to have some people. Let's get them. We have to have a next generation, first of all. Secondly, we need to teach the next generation. What are we going to do with the next generation once we have it? Hint, it's not happening at your local government school. The opposite is happening. I love uh, George Orwell, Animal Farm. Some of you might recall Orwell the genius. A couple things that Orwell did. First of all, when they kick out the drunk farmer and the animals take over, all the animals are all for it. Yay, the animals are here now. 
we're going to police ourselves. You'll remember there are a couple of pigs that figured out what was going on. Remember their names? Napoleon and Snowball. They knew what was happening. But there's one animal that wasn't quite on board. It was a raven. Remember his name? Interesting name. Name was Moses. <laughs> interesting. But more interesting. The animals finally figure out that Napoleon Snowball were worse than the farmer that they kicked out. They finally figured it out. But something happened before. And this has to do with educating the next generation. Please hear me on this. Please, please hear me. You see, when the animals took over, Napoleon and Snowball were way ahead of all the other animals. They said, you know what? To the dogs, to the mom and dad dogs, they said, you know what? You're not really capable of educating your own children. Why don't you let us educate your children? And the dogs said, okay, sure. Why not? Less responsibility for us. Free education. So when the animals later figure out that Napoleon and Snowball, the pigs, were worse, far worse than the farmer they threw out, they're ready for another rebellion. And they're just about to take over and kick Napoleon and Snowball out. When suddenly the back door opens and a band of snarling, slobbering, fang-exposed dogs comes back in through the back room and gets them all back in the line. And some of the more perceptive ones realize who those dogs were. They were the ones. They were the pups that we gave to Napoleon and Snowball. And now they're grown-up dogs. And now they're going to keep us in line. We have to teach the next generation us if we believe in Christ. And we can't give them over to people who hate Christ, hate his word, hate his law, hate his kingdom. Thirdly, we need a sacrifice for the next generation. That word sacrifice is a tough word for some people. For some, it's like giving something up and getting nothing back, but the Bible ways is actually an investment. I know, I know of a woman who worked really hard for the next generation. She had a lot of children. Diapers, runny nose, Skin knees, hardly any time to get a break, hardly any time to get a nap. Now this woman sees her grandchildren all the time, sees her children all the time, and she is getting back the love that she put out, and she's getting it back with interest. So it wasn't really a sacrifice, was it? It was an investment. I know this woman very closely. I know how hard she worked. And know how much she's loved today. And that woman is my wife. See, we call it a sacrifice. But you don't really, when, when it's doing God's work, there's really no sacrifice. Not really. Because be sure, as Paul says, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. My friends, do you know Christ tonight? His word is true. He died on that cross for a reason. He died to set us free from our sins. I hope you know that, Christ, because freedom begins with that Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for your kind attention here tonight. <laughs> Do we even have time for questions? I, I'm, I'm not sure how long I went, but... Okay, all right. Question right here. I just wanted to say, I'm one of them fellows went to school years ago in a one room school. The you know, the Mennonites, we read the Bible, we prayed, we saluted the flag. No, we don't about the flag. We read the Bible, we prayed. There's our problem. Yeah. In my opinion, is the Christians today are sitting on their haunches. Did nothing about stopping Bible coming out of God coming out of the schools. It's a shame. We we got we have to understand something here. For the freedoms that we enjoy, people bled and died. Yeah, I remember thinking during COVID. <laughs> and we had, um, we got thrown, the COVID.
pre-tendemic or the plandemic. Uh, one thing it was definitely not is a pandemic. It was definitely not that. <laughs> Clearly not that. L leave it to the pagans, right? Whenever they say something is the way it is, you can always be sure that that's not true. Maybe you don't know what is true, but you can be sure that what they're saying is definitely not true. But anyway, these socialist communists. Anyway, what happened was um, we got thrown out of our, the, where we were, and we, we, we met one time on Zoom or, or whatever it was. And then we, a very courageous person in our church had a pavilion and offered to let us use that. And you might remember back in 20, 2020, there were all kinds of threats flying around about what's going to happen to you if you meet and how many people you're going to kill and how coughing is in public is now a federal offense. And I remember thinking, I guess I'm pretty brave for conducting a service during this nonsense. I remember thinking too, if I get arrested, if I get arrested, I'll be home for supper. People that came before me faced the stake. I'm not facing anything. We enjoy what we have today because of those who came before us, who loved God, loved Christ, loved his word, and sh great shame on us for neglecting it. Shame, shame, shame. Thank you for your question. We have another question back here. Good question. And um, uh, how much more time do we have? Because I, I, I can make a really long end, but I don't want to take. No, you're, you're good. Okay. All right. I don't want to go too long here. A um, couple things. Judges, lawyers, and so forth. To me, that's, I don't want to say that's the easy part. There's plenty of books, there's plenty of things we can do. The harder part is the actual character that we need to instill in them. That's the harder part. If we teach the techniques of political involvement without teaching the character, it'll just be just like the dogs that they let in through the back door. So let me, let me address it this way. Um, I'm gonna tell a quick story. Um, my, one of my sons went to a, 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 a Christian school. We homeschooled him most of the time, but one of my sons went to a Christian school. And one day, they came, the, the leaders of the school, the principal, or, or came back and said, hey, uh, in Harrisburg, um, everybody, everybody grab onto your ketchup bottles because you might want to throw them at me after I say this. Um, in Harrisburg, they have a, uh, they have a day in which the, the, you know, high schoolers can come in and learn how a bill is made. And they can learn how to debate it and what happens. It goes in the committee and then they do, do, do all this. And, and, and this, then, it, then people argue and then people decide if they want to support it or not. And we want to show them how a bill is made. Would you like, would you like your son to be involved in that? Yeah. Well, I said, absolutely not. No way. No way in the world. You think, you think that really happens? You think somebody gets up there and argues the constitutionality of a bill and everybody sits around and says, oh, I don't know, I got my copy of the Pennsylvania Constitution and I don't know if that qualifies. Are you kidding me? Are you, are, you, are you nuts? No, they're about making deals with lobbyists and that's how it gets done. I didn't, I didn't want my son to think that anybody really cares about what's said on the floor except for grandstanding. My point is this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Without that, I don't want to teach them how to be judges, lawyers. 
we must start with the character. There's plenty, I believe, of material out there to teach them how to do these other things, judges, lawyers, committeemen even, but we must start, we must start with character development. We, we must start there. Not end, not end there, but we must start. I fear that the reason why we don't teach this like we should is because we really don't know what to do with our kids even if they get there. Now what? If we don't have the basis of the scriptures, what are they gonna do once they get there except what's being done now? Good question, I thought I saw another hand. Yes, Moses. One other thing that we're missing is, you know in the old days, the wise people would sit at the gates and they would give counsel. Recently, a friend of mine who was all living here came to visit him again here in his county. We're driving past the retirement community. I said, you know, that's the saddest place right there. All those people are inside those walls where they used to sit at the gates and they would govern, not govern, but give counsel and, and judge between people. So we're missing the elderly that can teach us the history in, in, in ways that yeah. would have known in, in their history. Let, let me. Second, uh, we have we no longer have the like the founding fathers always had a tool. Go back to the ancient scripture. The priest would always teach another person. We're not discipling people. When I say discipling, I mean we're not discipling people in the ways that they should go because we don't have the younger people working with the older people. Uh, we've lost that, that, that mentor that our founding fathers would have had, the tutors and the, the teachers that would have had that, that model. Yeah, there's, there's no question. I'm, I'm going to say it, but it's kind of a simplistic response here. Um, but let me give this. We have, we, we have divided up our social sphere, our social relationships, perfectly wrongly in this sense. God's idea is grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren. And the wisdom from the grandparents coming down to the children. That's the way he's designed it. They should be exposed to their grandparents. They have a lot to say to them. I mean, who's more invested in grandchildren than grandparents? Except for parents, maybe. I don't know about that, though. I have grandchildren now. and uh, when, when you I, I, well, well, here's the thing. I, I tell my children, you, you don't have to come over. You can just send the grandchildren over. Let, let me finish here um, about this. What we've done instead now is we've, we've done exactly opposite. God's way is, is vertical like this. Our way is parallel now, right? Put all the children in different grades, separate them all out, right? Right? Mom and dad are out working someplace, right? Grandparents in the old folks' home, right? We've divided up our social relationships perfectly wrong. It's just one of the many things we've done. But that is done by design. No question. These are all Alinskian principles that are put in place by the government and, and profiteers, too, people profiting yeah. from it. But this is all done by the nuns. Yeah, yeah, there's one of the things that I'm grateful for as a pastor is I can stand up and say, listen, these people that are doing these things, this keeps me sane, by the way, these people that are doing these things, these are not people that are mistaken. These are not people that just need a little more information. See, that's our, that's our problem, isn't it? Oh, they, they would never do this if they just had the right information. So we'll get out there and give them the right information. No, no, no. They have all the information they want, and they're evil, wicked people. And part of our problem is we have not taken the people seriously enough that say they want to depopulate the world. We have not taken them seriously. And I got news for you. They're serious. And we haven't taken the people serious that said they're going to divide us. Which they, which, they, which they effectively have. And that's my point here tonight. What is it that we can rally around? We must rally around truth. And that truth, that source of truth is the word of God. Everything else is sinking sand. Yes. We can take one more question. Okay. I thank everyone for your very kind attention. I'll be right here.